So today we've got um, three speakers. We've got um, Maria Stylo, who is a leading member of the SWP sister organisation in Greece. We've got uh, Matt Collins, who is um, from People Before Profit, a councillor in Belfast. And we've got John Rose, who has been a member of the SWP since 1968 and joined, you know, because of um, the experience of 1968. So each of them are going to speak for about 10 minutes. Uh, then we'll open up the, the meeting to discussion. Um, so I'll just bring, um, ask Maria to kick off the meeting for us. Hello. I speak about 68, but I speak also about today, because I think 68 does belong to the past. I think we've got many examples that we can use for today, and I think 68 is in the agenda today, even if we've got a bad picture of what's happening around. So from this point of view, I come to, to one main thing. 68 really destroyed two big myths that existed up to then. The first big myth is that society cannot change from below anymore. May 68 was 50 years after the Russian Revolution. So it wasn't very far away, really, of what happened to Russia. But it was so after so many big events, the Second World War, uh, a period of rising of capitalism, the two blocks, uh, what's happening to the East and West. Uh, so it was almost uh, a common attitude, or oh, it was a tremendous importance for the ruling classes all around the world to teach us then that things cannot change from below. Forget what you've got as an example 50 years ago. That was one thing, actually. And the second thing is forget about the working class revolution. There is no any possibility. You've got really, in such a circumstance, to accommodate yourself uh, to more realistic solutions, to solutions that there will be so social democratic or sort of uh, popular front governments that they can really lead us somewhere. And the main thing is that May 68 destroyed both of those two myths. I come to the first myth. Society cannot change from below. Society cannot change, full stop. I came as a student at LSE in 19, 1966. And I do remember a few things. I mean, how, how they were trying to taught us everywhere. I remember getting into the old theater of LSE, and uh, uh, I remember Isaac Deutscher talking about Trotsky and what happened to Russia and Stalin, etc. And I remember Tony Cliff attacking him that he doesn't have a theory of what's happening in Russia, in the Eastern Bloc. He doesn't have a theory of what happened, what does it mean, the, the crisis of the Eastern Bloc now. And I remember Deutsche saying, there is no crisis, there is stability in the Eastern Bloc. That's what Deutsche said in '66. And I remember two years afterwards, he couldn't even defend his position. He couldn't even say what happened in Prague, in all around. I remember a second example. Back to Greece, before I came, you had the, the government and the left-wing parties, the reformist parties, in 66, uh, saying that we don't have the, the danger of a of a military coup enough in Greece because we are part of the common market. We are part of the European market. And that the more you are linked to the European market, the more you are linked with their liberal democracy, 
the more you can fight those jantas, those uh, militaries, etc. Year after that, where the, right, the left was so confident, where the government, a sort of socialist uh, center, centrist government, was so confident that they, there was one of the worst uh, military coups in the center of Europe, in Greece. That, that's actually how we were taught what were the prevailing ideas in these periods. And it was more than that. It was, I, I've got an extra example. In LSE, you had Ralph Miliband teaching politics and uh, economics and sociology, mainly politics. You know Miliband, you probably know his sons, but anyway, he was the father of the big sons, very good breeding, and he, 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 he was teaching us why the state is a bad thing. But the only thing that you can move further is accepting this state, and accepting more than this state, accepting Harold Wilson, because Harold Wilson was in the government then, and accepting more than that, Accepting Harold Wilson attacking the Siemens strike and crush the Siemens strike because they were a threat. They were a threat from below and things cannot change from below. You understand the environment, you understand the attitude from above, from the ruling class, from the academy, from the parties, from all around, how they, they, they were teaching, they were trying to confront the crisis that was coming and they could see that it was coming. For, fortunately, there is always a resistance from below, then and today. It was a resistance from below. It was students fighting all around. There were people all around, the, it was the anti-war movement. In LSE, we are good, we are happy, we are, because we had old comrades coming from the States as a draft resistors. And we were saying, fuck them, we've got to kick them out. We are draft resistors, we came from the anti-war movement, we've got to build anti-war movement here in England, that was their point, and they helped quite a bit to build that anti-war movement. You had small strikes, not the big strikes before, but you had small strikes all around, and you had actually workers coming to the LSE and asking us when we had general assemblies and uh, People, uh, I mean, students' assemblies, not general assemblies, with a union that actually was controlled by the Labour Party, but it wasn't really controlled, because the, le the revolutionary left was present there, and the revolutionary left played a tremendous role inside LSE and inside the universities at that period. So you had the problem, there is strike, what can we do, it's not a big one, what are the workers? Forget the workers, they don't exist. We've got really to build every, in every, in every general uh, student's assembly, we were discussing how we can go to the places and sell the newspaper. The small uh, socialist worker newspaper then. How we can sell it at Barbican. Then it wasn't Barbican, it was a, a site how we can sell it in Fleet Street. Now it's not the new Fleet Street, it was the old Fleet Street. How we can sell here and there. So you can sense the radicalization along with all these ideas, or the, along with all these problems, the radicalization that came from below. And it didn't come only, they were building. That's the important thing. And that's actually how we reached May 68. Not in England, not in France, but all around the world. That's, I mean, something that we can always have in mind 
when we are living in a period that they still bring the argument that, look, those that are having a power, that those can, can determine our ideas, those can determine our future, they are more powerful than us. Look, all the polarization, not in economics, but also in, in politics, how we can find the, fight those polarizations. And we can always have the arguments of how this radi radicalization, how the changes of ideas actually, how we were building while we were creating the atmosphere so that you can have the tremendous anti-war movement. You can have really the solidarity. You can have the, the creation of, peop of workers and we can have actually all the, the coordination between the di different movements. I think that, that's, that's very important for, for then and it's very important for now. And I think it's very important for now because their crisis is tremendous. The way that they try really to solve their crisis is by dividing us, is by saying you are powerless, by saying that, okay, you, you had a tremendous upheaval for 10 years. You destroy all the political plans of the ruling classes, governments, dictatorships, wars, women's liberation, anti-fascist, anti-racist. You, you made that. You created big revolutionary organizations, yes, but you lost everything. They're trying to say, as they were saying in 68, the revolution, the Russian revolution belonged to the past. They were saying now that the 68 belongs to the past. And we are saying no. No for three reasons. The first reason is that at the present, the experience of people who fought in the last 10 years against uh, the austerity, against uh, racism, against fascism. I've got the example in Greece. They are stronger than they were t 10 years ago. That's one thing that we've got to, to take in mind. Actually, in Greece, uh, 10, 10 years ago, the right had the control of the political situation. The right had the control of the ideas, of everything. Through this process, through the 10 years fight and struggle, actually we have two new things. The first is the move to the left generally, so the Tsipras government and so on and so forth. And the second thing is a, a tremendous uh, anti-racist, anti-fascist movement that actually was able to put uh, the fascist in jail and have one of the biggest struggle and obliged and be behind Tsipras all the time to open the borders, to close the concentration camps, to allow uh, the refugees free in, uh, in the country and free along with the workers. So we are in such a situation. So we've got to have in mind that May six, the, the examples of May 68 are here now in our life in facing really a ruling class that is vicious. Vicious in economics, vicious in politics, vicious in the way that they try to divide us. But on the other hand, the, the radicalization, what happened in Spain this year and the year before? What happened in Ireland? What happened in Greece? What happened all around? The resistance is there. It's against every, what happens in the States? The resistance is there. 
and the revolutionary left has got all the experience to build again, to build again on, its, uh, on all these fronts, to build again for the perspective of the working class uh, solidarity and to build again on the anti-capitalist perspective. So here we are in this period, I think the May 68 is a tremendous uh, example. Our fight now is more important for our countries, for, our, uh, for the working class, for all around the world. We won in the first time, we've got to win much better in the second. Okay, thanks very much, Maria. We're now going to hear from Matt. Thanks very much, Julie. Um, and first of all, just to thank the organizers for inviting me along here. It's great to be back um, at Marxism 2018. And I suppose I'd, I'd firstly better say that I'm very conscious that in a meeting like this, people are more keen on hearing from uh, the likes of John Rose and, and, and Maria as opposed to myself and those who are veterans of the struggles of 1968. So I'll try and uh, keep my comments brief. Nor really is it possible for me to give uh, an historical talk on, on, on the importance of 68 in Ireland and the civil rights movement. So I'll try to stick to the question, what's its legacy um, and really what's its, its importance today. And I think that really we have to understand that for socialists, we don't just look at 1968 for its historical value, as, as Maria well said. We look at it really because we think that the revolutionary wave that 68 unleashed across Europe contains important lessons uh, for class struggle today. And indeed, part of the reason that I think the struggles of 68 are so pertinent today is because in many ways, what people were fighting against in 68 and what people were fighting for in 68 is more vital than ever. If you only take a look, for example, at the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States and how that stands in the tradition of Martin Luther King, you only need to look, for example, at the way in which militarism almost constantly uh, gathers over the Middle East and, 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 and who here wouldn't argue that the tradition of, of the anti-Vietnam War movement is needed now more than ever. And I think that perhaps uh, no more important than anywhere else, uh, but equally important is the struggle uh, for civil rights and the struggle for socialist politics back at home in the north uh, of Ireland. We, uh, we live in a corrupt sectarian state which in any way uh, Fadwell can't deliver for working class people. It's the 50th anniversary of 68 here today. It's also worth saying that it's the 20th anniversary this year of the Good Friday Agreement. Now, for anyone that follows Irish politics, there's been much fawning and much uh, kind of liberal gushing over uh, 20 years ago, I assume, in the hope that that type of spirit can get us beyond the political impasse that we're in in the North at the minute. But what I would contest and what I'd like to suggest is that actually the tradition of 1968, the tradition of people power, the tradition of internationalism, the tradition of socialism from below, it points the way forward, not the type of institutionalized sectarianism uh, of the Good Friday Agreement. Because really today, the establishment, it promotes the view that things can't change, as, as Maria well said. Um, I think it suits capitalism to, to, to promote that view. It suits the establishment that people might accept that the world's corrupt and the world's rotten, but actually you can't change it. Go home and do nothing. But a cursory glance at the 1960s, and 1968 in particular, shows you things do change, things can change, and things change quickly when people mobilize from below. Um, and that's the lesson, really, of 1968. 1968 was the year that the North exploded. Um, of course, the Northern state that was formed after partition in 1921 was a state based upon sectarianism. It was a state which had repression entrained into it. It was a state which could call on the British Army any time in its hour of need. It was a state which used a quasi-paramilitary police force, uh, the Beach Specials, and later the UDR. It was a deeply repressive state based upon uh, discrimination, based upon uh, constant attacks upon working class people. And, and, and on the surface, actually, as, as Maria said, it was a state which presented itself as one that was stable, one that was triumphalist and all the rest of it. But actually, underlying the surface and underneath the surface, the contradictions that were bubbling across Europe uh, would soon reach uh, the north. 
And I think that one, well, I don't have time to go into the civil rights movement in detail, but one crucial aspect, of course, is the international context and the international that, that kind of dimension that swept our own little patch of ours. I think there's a tendency to view Ireland and to view the north of Ireland in particular because it functions on, on the basis of a, a kind of uh, you know, the, the, the sectarianism that's apparently inherent within it. People see it on the basis of its own internal dynamic, but any time the Irish revolutionary struggle has increased, has intensified, it's always done so um, on a, uh, in line with a global level. That's true uh, at the birth of radical republicanism, for example, with the United Irishmen. It's true during the Fenian movement, which coincided somewhat with the Chartist movement. It's, of course, true with 1916 and the wave of revolutions that swept uh, Europe culminating in, in 1917, 1917 in Russia. And of course, 1968 was no different. 1968 was a moment when the strategies of protest and people power and mass agitation and non violent civil rights protest um, swept cities like Belfast and Derry. I think the great Derry socialist Eamon McCann put it very well when he said that in his hometown in Derry in 68 and 69, People weren't looking back to the great figures of Irish nationalism. They were looking across the world. They were looking to people like Martin Luther King. They were looking to the student movement in the Sorbonne in Paris. They were looking to Prague. They were looking to Greece. They were looking uh, all, all over the world. And of course, that's, that's very evident. You know, if you take some of the most famous civil rights marches in 1969, the Burntollet March was consciously modeled upon uh, the Selma and Montgomery March, uh, marches of 1965 in the United States. Of course, these were seminal moments in the black freedom struggle, which forced uh, the federal government to enact reforms. Now, of course, reforms didn't come easy in the North, um, and the civil rights movement was met with deep, deep repression. The Burntollet March, for example, in particular, uh, was, was attacked and beaten quite seriously uh, by loyalists, by Paisleyites, but also uh, by, by, by crowds of loyalists who were aided and abetted by the state, by the RUC. And, and of course, that was the pattern as things went forward. The British state's intervention too, after uh, the burning out of Bombay Street in 1969, the British state's intervention was one to shore up British imperialism. It was one to shore up the unionist government in the north. And of course, the history of that period is well known. It's a history of internment without trial. It's a history of curfews. It's a history of shoot to kill. It's a history of innocent people uh, murdered in the streets in Bala Murphy and in the Bloody Sunday March in Derry. The power of, of imperialism in the North ensured that violence and repression met the civil rights movement and solidified the sectarian nature of the Northern state as the, as the conflict that follows uh, would, of course, testify. But nevertheless, I think 1968 offered a glimpse into a different type of future and a different type of world, world uh, that we can all take great heed in today. I think the struggle from below rocked the very foundations of the northern state in 1968. I mean, it's interesting that if you look at the, at the period of history, the 50 years and after the formation of the northern state, yep, uh, the two main traditions in, in Irish society were the, the parliamentary tradition of the Nationalist Party and the politics of the gun. Both had failed, both had failed uh, miserably, both the IRA's border campaign in, in the 50s and 60s, and of course the kind of cul-de-sac of, of parliamentary abstentionism of the Nationalist Party. But in the space of, of, of a few months, the civil rights movement had delivered more change and more reforms and, and, and managed to put more pressure on the unionist government than years of, of doing nothing from establishment politicians or years of, of, of guerrilla warfare could ever do. And that's really the lesson of 1968. I think if you look at it, it was certainly the case that the state in the North emerged as irreformable in the North. But ultimately, small gains were won and reforms were won. If you take, for example, the issue of housing, an issue which certainly has not gone away in cities like Belfast and Derry. I'm a councillor in Belfast City Council, and every day our office is inundated with what we could only really describe as horror stories over housing. Housing was a central pillar of the civil rights movement because of the way that uh, the Orange State um, uh, kind of practiced the, distri the distribution of housing um, in the 50s and the 1960s. What changed was the mass movement and the mass people power movement that erupted during the civil rights campaign. The development of the housing executive, for example, was a serious gain brought about uh, by the civil rights movement. It was not brought about by the gun, nor was it brought about by parliamentary politicians. And I think that if we fast forward on to today, um, I, have to, I have to finish up soon. I think, of course, it's the case uh, we're not in 1968 anymore, but nor are we in 1988 in, in Ireland. Uh, we don't no, no longer live in an orange state. 
Um, but we do live in a sectarian state. We, we live in a state which actively denies rights. People in this room may have been a bit shocked when they found out that Theresa May uh, was getting into government with the DUP. When you actually look at some of the politics of the DUP, the DUP is an organisation which still to this day denies people the most fundamental rights, the right of, of, of women to access basic abortion and health care, the right for the gay community to get married, to marry the person that they love, the right for the Irish language community to live their lives through their native tongue. These are all basic rights which uh, should be attributed to people. And much like the old big house unionists of the 1950s and, and, and the 1960s, the DUP seek to promote an image of stability to their own particular project, but we all know that it's deeply unstable. So today we need a new civil rights movement, and that's the lesson of 68. We need a new civil rights movement which can unite working class people, Catholic, Protestant and other, beyond the sectarian divide and the fight for equality for all. And I think that it's in that sense that this, one of the central themes, of course, of this conference is internationalism. And that's why it's extremely important, because really, if you look at the international scene, the race to the future is really on. There's a massive polarization across the globe. There's massive instability. There's a clear polarization between uh, left and right. If you take the issue of Brexit, for example, um, you know, the Brexit has really intensified the national question in Ireland. And I think you know, if you look at it on the one hand, Brexit has the potential to strengthen uh, the partition in Ireland through a hard border and all the rest of it. But actually, on the other, it also has the potential to open up the Irish national question in a way that it hasn't done for generations. It has the potential to bring about the dismantling of the British state. And I think socialists should be for the dismantling of the British state. They should be for the breakup of the union. And I'll finish by saying this. Uh, it's great to be here at this conference. I think that members of the British Socialist Workers Party can, have a, can be very proud of their organisation, be very proud of the tradition of their organisation, particularly when we talk about 1968. People in this room can be very proud, for example, to be part of a group which fully supported the civil rights movement of activists like Chris Harmon, who came over and actively supported the civil rights movement, an organisation which called uh, for troops out of Ireland, an organisation which stood against collusion and all the rest of it, particularly in times uh, which wouldn't have been popular. And I think it's in that sense that the Irish struggle for socialism has always been strengthened by, by yourselves and the British left and by groups like yourselves and the British left. And that's why, really, it's equally important for us to see a heightening of struggle against Theresa May, against this rotten austerity government, against their vision of, 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 uh, of austerity, against their vision of Brexit, actually, and instead one that actually puts a left vision uh, for, for, for leaving the EU and for dismantling the EU. Because actually, as the national question um, uh, intensifies in Ireland, that's where things are at. We say Ireland out of the EU, Britain out of Ireland, and solidarity to all international socialists fighting for the advancement of working class people in Greece and London and across the world. So thanks very much. So I'll bring John to speak now. There was a slogan in 1968, demand the impossible. Now, that's, of course, absurd. But on the other hand, those three words capture a kind of mood in the moment that was incredibly exciting when the most unlikely things happened that you weren't expecting at all. There was another slogan, students of the world ignite. It sounds absurd. Students of the world ignite. It tells us a couple of things, though. It tells us about 68 as being an international student movement an international revolutionary student movement, and that slogan, Students of the World Ignite, which sounds absurd, nevertheless, at least in France, was literally true. When the students were fighting the French police, on, on, uh, on, literally on the barricades in, in Paris and other cities, in May 68, almost by magic, and incidentally, in my ear, I was listening to the members of the International Associates, and I wasn't a member, talking about the working class and revolution, not really believing it. And then, almost magically, we saw the 10 million workers in France, partly triggered, ignited by the students, occupy their factories. We had the wonderful image of President de Gaulle jumping in his helicopter and flying out of Paris because they were so terrified. And there was a moment, it was a revolutionary moment. Now, I don't want to go into the details, I haven't got time, but the French Communist Party, amongst others, was a conservative force which stopped that movement moving forward. And I'll come back to the significance of that in a few moments. But it was, that was the high point of a number of high points. And it was incredibly exciting and by definition, as I've described it, incredibly important. Um, there were also some political adventures. 
and uh, I had the good fortune to be a student and a comrade of Maria at the London School of Economics. And I have to tell you that she led a political adventure of her own when the Greek colonels uh, seized power in Greece in April 1967. Maria and a number of students and other, um, we'll call them street anarchists, um, piled, got together in a huge w wagon, arrived at the Greek embassy. Maria, with a bunch of flowers, knocked on the door and the Greek ambassador's assistants opened the door and we were all piled in and occupied the embassy. And this was, happening, <laughs> this was happening all over the world and we naively thought this might somehow put an end to the Greek colonel's coup and it didn't. Um, Amongst other things, I got three days in Brixton prison. And I don't know whether this is a, um, a good or a bad thing. Only three days in prison in 50 years being revolutionary. That's not really terribly impressive, I don't think. It's possibly a reflection on uh, British politics. But anyway, I thought I'd just throw that in because um, I think it's an important point. And another rather more serious political adventure, Ronnie Caswell, who was speaking tonight, was a sociology student in my sociology class Lisi was pretending to be, he was actually an underground African National Congress operative and was recruiting students to go to South Africa on, I'm going to call it an adventure, but it's actually a very serious political adventure, uh, intervention and potentially a very dangerous one. I'm going to say no more about it because we're talking about it tonight. But it's part of the 1968 legacy and not, not an unimportant part of it. So in a way I'm talking about political experimentation and political adventure. But I think there's a third political, and that's political argument. Political argument ultimately was incredibly important. On the one hand, the workers in Paris demonstrated the capacity of the working class. There still needs to be an argument about the significance of this, especially when it kind of died down. That argument was carried by a very sophisticated group of international socialism cadres. Tony Cliff used to come down regularly, but Chris Harmon was a student at the LSE, and I wrote about Chris Harmon in the International Socialism Journal, if people read it, the issue before, the one that's just come out. Um, and Chris played a, a, an incredibly important role, and, and, and has sadly not really been, been properly recognised as one of the student leaders of 1968, but he certainly was. And partly just as a result, and of course his book, quite correctly, is being um, promoted here all this time afterwards, 50 years afterwards, it's still one of the best summaries, the best political insights into 1968, but Chris played a strategically important role in one particular sense. Now, just be before I get on to Chris, I want to make one further point about Ronnie Caswell and Tony Cliff and political argument. They disagreed in 1967 about the Six-Day War between Israel and Egypt. I was from a Jewish background. I was more and more interested in revolutionary socialist politics, but when the Six-Day War started, I supported Israel, as did most of the other Jewish students, who at the same time were very sympathetic to what the International Socialist-led Student Socialist Society was doing. Ronnie Caswell and Tony Cliff had a mammoth teaching, but the teaching wasn't about, do you support Israel, do you support Egypt? Oh, no. The teaching was about whether, revol whether Nasser was a serious enough revolutionary to defeat Israel. Now, that was a very important argument, but I was seeing something else. I was seeing Tony Cliff of Jewish origins, Ronnie Kalsos of Jewish origins, supporting the Arabs. That was equally mind-boggling in its own way. I couldn't believe it. Um, but there were six days of a six-day war and there's six days of a teaching on the campus. That was true not just at the LSE, it was true across the world, by the way. I mean, in many ways, this was the beginnings of the... Although we know that the Arab side lost in the six-day war and Israel grotesquely expanded itself, nevertheless, the Palestinian issue was put on the political stage for the first time in a way that it hadn't been before. And that was incredibly important. And that was also quite a, well, a fundamentally transformative experience. Um, and it's, uh, it's very much still part of the legacy. But to return to Chris, I really want to use the remaining time to talk about Chris and to talk about two, how I got us, two really important documents, quite apart from the book. One of the interesting aspects of the Student Worker Alliance, which was always slightly romanticized, but it raised a separate question, a rather more serious question. What is the relationship, not so much in a general sense between students and workers, but between intellectuals and workers inside a revolutionary organization? And Chris, Chris moved on to that argument. Um, his, 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 his essay, Party and Class, which is part of a book, Mark's book called Party and Class, with three other essays in it. Nevertheless, Chris's essay, written in 1968, is outstanding. It was outstanding then, it's outstanding now because he addresses this question and he raises the idea of students in a revolutionary organization, workers in a revolutionary organization, learning from each other. 
learning from each other and raising their political understanding together based upon different experiences, an experience of reading on the one hand, an experience of life as working class on the other, and what that teaches. And Chris uses Gramsci, as well as obviously Lenin and indeed Rosa Luxemburg, in an incredibly effective way. And I'm going to be very interested, I'm one of the meetings I'm very keen to go to is Alex Kalinikos talking about Gramsci and the art of politics, I think it's on Sunday morning, um, because Gramsci's role in seeing the intellectual in the worker activist is incredibly important, something we need to fully understand and draw out. And it's, 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 a, it's a strategic part of what it means to build a revolutionary organisation. Three minutes left, and I want to devote them to the other document, which is what the one I wrote about, which is the document called the Open Letter to the Polish Communist Party. One of the most important, or some, in some ways, possibly even the most important aspect of 1968 was the exposure, not just of the rottenness of Western capitalism, but of the rottenness of Soviet communism in all its different manifestations and its satellites. The open letter of the Polish Communist Party had been written by two dissident communists, Kuron and Modulewski, two, three years before, which had an analysis of Poland which was almost identical to Tony Cliff's state capitalist analysis. But the, 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 the difference is they weren't part of a small revolutionary group. They themselves regarded themselves as communists and were part of this enormous, or had been part of this enormous machine called Soviet communism, if you include its satellites. So that document, that open letter, became an incredibly important document. It remains so in my view. It remains arguably the single most important document of 1968 because it took on what Soviet communism was and what it wasn't. And it claimed it was a class-divided society where a state ruling class exploits a working class. And it provided an argument, especially when the Prague Spring, I mean, in Chris's book, quite correctly, the, 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 the May events form one chapter and the Prague Spring comes immediately afterwards. And it's like a couplet because the revolt was against both sides of the so-called Iron Curtain. And both were led by students. Unfortunately, in the Prague situation, the workers' movement was much more underdeveloped. Um, nevertheless, the principle it was the same. and It was a challenge to both of these systems. Why? Because both of these systems turned out to be, in, in some respects, mirror images of each other. Chris promoted the open letter, and it was produced as a pamphlet and sold on the campuses. And that provided us with a cutting-edge argument. Um, the International Socialists grew out of the student struggles, the campus struggles, the sit-ins that we had, other sit-ins across the country. And as Maria pointed out, the Vietnam War um, was an incredible mobiliser in terms of resistance to it, etc. And the revolt in the American cities, both against the war and the Black Revolt, all of these factors were incredibly important. But in terms of the, the, the arguments in the movement, to have an argument which defended, in quotes, communism with a small c, of workers' power, of a genuinely equal society without classes, to have an argument, and at the same time to be able to categorically deny that Soviet communism was indeed communist, was incredibly powerful. Chris played a strategically central role in developing that argument, and as a result, the International Socialists became the single most important part of the student movement. The student movement went down very quickly. Cliff summed up a, Cliff had an aphorism saying the students go off like a rocket and come down like a stick, and that was very, very true. And of course, when we came down, it was incredibly important to have revolutionary organizations that were capable of catching people on the down and be able to sustain them a, a, a morale and confidence and uh, develop, to develop them as cadres to fight in the struggles which indeed did develop in the 1970s. Um, I really am going to keep to the summing up uh, 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 instruction and, and stop at this point uh, 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 and uh, say no more. Okay. Um, I, I want to talk about 1968 because I was there and I was part of a poster workshop that existed in Camden Town and we printed lots and lots of posters. Now we were inspired by what we saw and heard and happen in France. Um, I had no idea about revolution. And I was completely green. I came from Blackpool uh, re just before, and I arrived in London. I didn't know anybody. Uh, but I heard about all the things that were going on in France and how inspiring it was, and people were tearing the streets up. And it was just 
uh, had such an impact on my life that I really went through a baptism of fire very quickly because I met people who had just come off the boulevards, been throwing stones, and I met people who just come back from Cuba, and they were all talking wildly about revolution, and I began to see that the system that I felt had oppressed me all my life could be changed. I grasped that hope and that sense that it could be changed. And suddenly, I met people who had set up a workshop to make posters, and they had a person from France, a student, who came along and helped us set it up. And one of the first posters we, we made was like this badge here. Uh, from the French Revolution posters. I don't know if you remember that poster, the chimney pot with a fist coming out of it. And now underneath, you've, got a, you've made a badge that says, La Lutte Continue. Well, I think that is the legacy and the lesson that came out of those times. The struggle still goes on. We still need to resist and fight against it. We made lots of posters and... Um, that's, that was our advert, and these are the sort of posters that we made, and you might know them. Uh, they're now in the Brit Tate Britain Gallery as a free show, and it's on till October. But the main thing I want to say about, about the posters that we learnt was how to make, how we were inspired to make a poster that was really strong and stood out. And um, we learned that it had to have a very clear, big, strident image with a s simple slogan underneath. Those two things make a good poster. And uh, we made many posters. We printed them for free, often for free, because people had no money. People came from organizations all over the world, from Pan-African groups, um, to people, local tenants in London, fighting against the uh, Can you GLSA for um, a rent strike. So the thing is that we really sort of learnt on our feet from the situation and we could rapidly respond, this is the big lesson, we could rapidly respond to a situation and print a poster during the night, with, dry it with hair dryers and rush it down to join a, a strike at the gates in Ford Dagenham in a matter of hours. We did all that without printing on computers, we did it all by hand, and there was no such thing as phones. So the whole time was really inspiring Sorry, and, and Could learning you sum up for there? us. Thank Thanks. you. Okay, followed by yourself. Uh, Maria mentioned how in 1968 we were told that the main focus of struggle was among students. Uh, this was, of course, the main argument put forward by Herbert Marcuse, who argued that the working class had been fully integrated into modern capitalism. Uh, John mentioned the famous, uh, inspiring uh, uh, strike by the, the 10 million, the general strike by 10 million French workers, but there were also strikes in this country. Uh, and last month saw the 50th anniversary of the Ford Women Sewing Machinist strike at Dagenham, when 187 women came out against sex discrimination in grading. Not for equal pay, but against sex discrimination in grading. Um, the uh, women had been placed in an unskilled B grade, although they did the same level of work as the uh, men placed in the semi-skilled C grade, it's a bit technical, but anyway. And the women, moreover, were paid 85% of the male rate. The, uh, the Dagenham strikers were soon joined by 195 Ford women workers at the Halewood plant on Merseyside. The women had no experience of collective struggle and were apparently quite unprepared to take on the mighty Ford Corporation, which uh, uh, in 1968 had an annual budget greater than that of India. But the strike, the women's strike, brought the entire uh, Ford uh, production process to a standstill. 
I was involved as a political activist, as an outside agitator, and it was an agitator's dream. 30,000 workers in a square mile uh, at Dagenham. Uh, and interestingly, the Communist Party, of course, were strong amongst the shop stewards. Um, not as strong as in, uh, they didn't resort to the kind of tactics that we witnessed uh, in those days in France or Italy, where, you know, uh, revolutionary uh, activists, you know, would, would get, uh, could get, well, could get roughed up. They were all very friendly uh, towards me. I interviewed the main uh, woman shop steward uh, Rose Boland for Socialist Worker, uh, an interview that was published in uh, Socialist Worker in September 1968. The women were invited to Barbara Castle for a famous tea party. Um, Barbara Castle, the employment secretary in Harold Wilson's government, and she fobbed them off with various empty promises. Uh, the women were granted 92% of the men's rate as a result of the strike, and it took another 16 years and a further seven-week strike, I think, uh, in 1984, before they won full equality with the men uh, uh, on the grading issue. And of course, as we know, women today still haven't achieved equal pay, uh, certainly not in, in, in the private sector. But the, the struggle of the Ford women in June 1968, and I believe that the, the Ford women were inspired by the French journal strike. I can't prove it, but it's certainly, uh, 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 things certainly Can point in that direction. Comments? And the women, the women's strike today remains a massive source of inspiration for, for women today still fighting for equality. Okay, the next speaker will be followed uh, by the comrade here. No, sorry, just in front. Oh, yeah, sorry, yourself, yeah. Uh, I was a, a student at the University of Leicester between 1966 and 1969, and I think if you're going to choose any three years to be a student, 66 to 69 takes a hell of a lot of beating. But um, um, in 1967, we had, after, after the London School of Economics uh, at Leicester, we had the, the second uh, student occupation of the university, and um, a tall, gangly, um, young man with uh, an incredible shock of black hair came along to speak to us, and, and that was, in fact, Chris Harmon. Um, 1968 embodies, for me, um, William Wordsworth, Wordsworth's words um, uh, describing the French Revolution, and that is, a bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. Um, 68, um, living through 68 was a little bit like living next to a volcanic lake. There was just these huge forces coming up to the surface and just bursting out in great explosive energy. Um, in no particular order, you had the, um, um, the student movement in Mexico during the, the time of the 1968 um, uh, Olympic Games that was, uh, was machine-gunned uh, in the Zocalo, the, the main square in, in Mexico City. Hundreds of students, they still don't know how many people were killed. You had the Tet Offensive in Vietnam against uh, the American forces. You had um, People's Democracy in, in Derry and, 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 the, and the Six Counties. You had, as just been mentioned, the, uh, the Ford Machinists. Uh, you had the Prague Spring. Um, uh, I mean, I, you had the, the death of Che Guevara, which, which introduced us who, who, who were too young to, to, to remember 1959, um, uh, introduced us to the, 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 the Cuban Revolution. And on top of that, you had the Jefferson Airplane. I mean, man, what, what more can you ask for? That sort of... Okay, uh, just to say we've already got quite a lot of um, people you know, putting up to speak, so if people try to keep their contributions as tight as they can, we'll get as many people in. Um, you're the next speaker. Um, yeah, well, I just wanted to start with the fact that, you know, <clears throat> I mean, ever since I was uh, quite young, if, everyone, if anyone uh, ever spoke about revolutions, it was always a thing of the distant past. You know, that's something people tried and failed between the French Revolution and till Russia, and people nev have never tried it again um, since. But that's what I find so inspiring and insightful from, you know, learning about the different movements that sort of erupted around 1968. And I think the title of Chris Harmon's book is absolutely perfect, The Fire Last Time. Um, 
I mean, I think it, as a Marxist and a, and a Bolshevik, of course, you're going to see revolutionary movements um, as fires, really. And, and of course, it, you know, I think it's, it's quite a useful one when you like think back to the Bolsheviks paper, Iskra, you know, Spark and so on. And, you know, while what happened in 68 weren't necessarily revolutions, they were definitely revolutionary. And really, I think what was lacking um, it was really leadership in any of these movements and so on, a, a political strategy and, and vision. But the, the fire itself um, was there. And I think it's no coincidence either that you know our party the socialist worker party or it was uh, back then is you know was born out of this fire and it's incredibly um inspiring and th that really makes me feel hopeful and wondering really i mean i mean when i looked into it you know actually a lot of trotskyist groups uh, emerged and re-emerged in the 70s uh following um 68 but you know it makes me really um excited really for the fire next time you know now that we have these organizations um, that can provide a political lead can provide a political strategy and that's really what the importance of the revolutionary party is about um, the contributions so far have been brilliant I mean the panel have been brilliant I can't wait to hear what more people have to say but you know, evidently I'm not in a room mostly full of students, but I think, you know, for everyone who's coming up here talking about their experiences of 68, you know, if you're not already a part of the Revol uh, Socialist Worker Party, I'd love for you jo to join. We have so much to learn from you guys. And really, I think that's evident in the fact that there's not enough students here, you know, to even know about 68. So, you know, if you live through it and you're not already a member of us, join us because we need to learn. Yeah, I came to this country in 1963 at the age of 16 and went straight to work in the factories. At that time, there was uh, so much racism in the factory that uh, there used to be nurses also the factory saying uh, no blacks, no Irish. And uh, there was so much cruel prejudice, like uh, if you sat next to a white person in the bus, some, often they'll get up and remove the seat. And in the factory, there were so many racist jokes and remarks. And uh, my family... Uh, after they cooked the curries, they used, to use so much uh, air freshener so that the neighbors won't uh, get the smell of curries because they hated the smell of curries. And uh, everything seemed so boring and gray, like everyone used to wear so gray and dark suits. And all the white people, they seemed like a monolith, like a brick wall. They all seemed the same, like you know, there was nothing could penetrate them. In the fact, if you made a complaint, suddenly all the whites will be on the same side and they'll be all you know, like a brick wall. But uh, in 1967, I started going to uh, full-time education, started doing A-levels. Even earlier at that time, there was still a lot of uh, uh, race amongst the students as well. But in 68, suddenly everything seemed to have changed. And uh, this sort of penetrated to the, uh, not from university, to the local uh, tech school uh, colleges as well. Even my own college, suddenly the students were become much more friendlier. And, uh, you know, we started having... Uh, uh, curry parties, in, and we sit in front put the endlessly in the curry party, uh, in the curries. <laughs> and suddenly, you know, it seemed like uh, there was tremendous change, and racism went to disappear, and there was so much uh, uh, fraternity and unity, and uh, this was the result of the, what everyone sort of knew, that the, what the students had started in university level, and it was penetrating down to the local tech level as well. And it was a tremendous change, which uh, was a fantastic see at the time. Yes, sometimes when we talk about 1968, it, it feels a bit, a bit like, you know, it, in Britain, it wasn't quite as exciting as, uh, uh, you know, across the world. But I think we have to say the impact was massive. It was huge. It even penetrated the, the small uh, mining town that uh, I was growing up in at age 16. Fantastic discussions about revolution and what was communism, what was socialism, what was anarchism. All these things were going on while we were at school. First time I saw a socialist worker, somebody selling outside the school. And, and, and Black Dwarf, uh, the paper that uh, Terry Galley uh, uh, produced. You know, the, these were really amazing times. But also I think we have to say um, that things were polarised, as Maria mentioned. And, of course, at that time, it's really... As part of a, the kind of ruling class fight back against what was happening in France and elsewhere was uh, the, the offensive which uh, Enoch Pell was em embodying with his uh, rivers of blood speech. That was about the ruling class trying to divide and rule and, and whip up racism. And things were, were polarised. I mean, for me growing up, it was about 
which side you, you were on, really, whether you were on the anti-racist uh, side against Pearl and everything you stood for, or, or, or with them. And of course, we know that uh, the Dockers marched in London to support uh, uh, Enoch Powell, and uh, some, some uh, of our uh, comrades at the time in IS, forerunners of the SWP, produced leaflets and stood against the strike and gave a lead, which, of course, a few years later, by the time, really, I think the impact of the, the French uh, uh, strikes and, and politically what was going on started to percolate through into the strikes in Britain. We saw the Dockers in 1973 leading the fight to smash the anti-union laws and uh, the, same, the same Dockers that have been marching for Powell. So you can see how, how things can change and how actually a, a revolutionary socialist organisation made, made a difference at that time because I was one of those young people inspired by uh, 68 that were then involved in strikes in the early 70s. And, th and I think you know, that was quite, uh, uh, quite a, a big thing, really. In, in, I was a journalist. There were lots of strikes in India. It was really forged in the 70s. I think that's part of the legacy of what 68 meant for, for people here in Britain. Because you know, though Pell's made his rivers of blood speech, there was no rivers of blood. We did have black and white unity. We did see off the National Front, who were then you know, seemingly unstoppable in the 70s. And I think what we have to we have to say the lessons are that we, 68 should have gone further. It showed resistance was possible, but actually we should have turned the revolt into revolution. And that means harnessing that uh, class power with revolutionary socialist organization. As I was listening to um, Matt, uh, Maria, and John, it struck me two things that are really, really important for us today. Is that first of all, 1968 came as a relative surprise, certainly to many people like the sociologists and so on, who said things about the working class that you hear a bit today, actually, that the working class is not striking enough, that there aren't the strike figures, and so on. Suddenly, that was altered completely. And the other thing that uh, is relevant for us today is that actually many revolutionary organizations were quite small and we see that it's uneven across the world. You know, in America, for example, there are small organ well, actually one of them is growing quite strongly. But what 1968 managed to do with the right politics is to turn those revolutionary organizations into larger, much larger organizations. And both those points are very relevant for us today. The other thing that I think is important is how really, for all of us who came from that tradition, how politics and economics are absolutely linked. You know, it was the students bravery and courage in the Latin Quarter that inspired the working class to then occupy the factories in Nantes and so on. And there's not a Chinese wall between politics and economics. And certainly for, you know, when it was in Derry that they looked to America and came out, that kind of connection is really important. And we see two things like that today. In America, the Trump, we know it's bleak in America, but the Trump demonstrations, I am sure, inspired the teacher strikes earlier this year. The fact that they had come out on the streets and that they had made that, in, in other words, in a political sense, also inspired white-collar workers in America to come out. Equally in Ireland, although the water charges was a different section of people to the people who came out on repeal, the lessons of people power were felt in repeal too. And so I think for us, it's really important to see how those politics can inform class struggle. And as long as people put those politics at the center of it and know that in America, although those possibilities are there, and by the way, the DSA is now 40,000 members, but unless they know that the other lesson is that the liberals and the Hillary Clintons and the Democrats will never provide a solution. That must be surely the biggest lesson, one that the DSA is not actually taking at the moment. As long as with those politics, and understand you can link the politics to the economics, our future is bloody bright. Um, Matt Collins was 
generous enough to make some very nice comments about the British SWP. I just want to put on record to him and to all the comrades who come from Ireland how pleased we are to have them here, that we feel very much part of the same struggle with them. Uh, that we learnt from them in 68 and their struggles inspired us then and we continue to celebrate their successes, to learn from them and to be part of the same movement, I hope, alongside them. Uh, because it is important to recognise the role it, that comrades in Ireland have played uh, over the last uh, decades. Um, I suppose I want to say two things. One is, there's a difference between naive optimism and recognising the way capitalism undermines itself. And from 68, you learn the potential for swift changes in the situation. And we always have to be alive to that. If you think about France, it was the necessity of the modernising of French capital which created an immense expansion of higher education, uh, creating huge grievances among students, which was very, very important. It was the fact that they were herding workers into factories and subjecting them to the sorts of conditions which were more typical of those of southern Europe under the military dictatorships and under Franco than under the so-called liberal democracies, which created the pressure cooker which burst open later on in that situation. And therefore, without thinking everything is wonderful, everything is going swimmingly, it's always important to recognise the potential for transformation. Because that's what 68 has shown us. And revolutionaries have to recognise also the potential for that in 2018 just as much. The second thing is politics and economics, Marnie just spoke very well about that. It's also true that the campaigning around those political issues was absolutely central to what happened in France and other places. Because the specific question was that of the Vietnam War and the protests against it, but also the Algerian War and the protests against it had produced a large group, uh, not mass group, but a group of people who were steeled in arguments and in being able to take on political organisation. And therefore, political organisation done properly can be crucial in the transformation later into mass workers' struggles. Can you sum up? Without the people involved in the politics, the workers' struggle would have been much more difficult. And that's why if we can break the racists today, it can lead to a transformation as well in the confidence of the working class more generally. Hi, so um, I don't have a story about 1968, but I do have a story about 2018. Um, so 50 years later, we can look at um, student and worker struggles um, through the UCU strikes. So um, I'm at uni, and a lot of the um, lecturers went on strike over their pensions. <coughs> Sorry. But there was a massive movement, I'm at York, um, with students supporting their lecturers and students coming out on strike, not going to lectures, standing on the picket lines, raising money, raising awareness of the way our lecturers have been treated. And we had such a, a unity of what we wanted our university to be. We weren't happy that we had a, a vice chancellor who we never saw telling us what we should and shouldn't do. Um, and so we, we came out on strike as students to support our lecturers and say, enough's enough. We want our university to be the way we want it to be. And I think, you know, looking back 50 years ago, um, I'm glad that, we, we, you know, we're, we're still, as students, standing strong with our lecturers and workers. So, yeah. Hi, um, Colin Bryce from uh, Lewisham uh, SWP. I just want to say a bit about uh, what, what happened um, to the movements of, of 1968, because I think one of the most magnificent things about Chris Harmon's book about 68 is that it's not just a celebration of the potential that was represented there, but it also is a really detailed, close, sensitive examination of what happened to all those movements in the decade afterwards and the lessons that we can learn from it. This is, the, everywhere around the world we, we saw the same thing. One of the big lessons is that the ruling class, the capitalist ruling class, rules not just by repression, but, but, but also by attempting to buy off a layer within the working class movement. It rules with a mixture of coercion and a mixture of consent. 
In the north of Ireland, for example, Bloody Sunday in Derry, where the British Army massacred people on the streets of Derry in an, att an attempt to terrorise the mass movement off the streets, went hand in hand with the strategy by the British ruling class to find moderates within the civil rights mo movement, represented by the SDLP, who they could work with to put together a power sharing, a power sharing a a a a executive. All across Europe, and in the United States, what happened in the decade after 1968 was a conscious strategy of trying to absorb as much of the movement as possible into the existing structures of society. In America, it was about uh, bringing some of the radicals into the Democratic uh, Party. In Britain, it was about drawing the trade union bureaucracy in, into the social contract and so on. Always and everywhere, the aim was to demobilize to de uh, and to disarm and to demoralize the mass movement that was taken to the streets that was on strike in the factories and so on. This is a really crucial uh, lesson for us because, you see, I think, I mean, I, I, for a talk yesterday that I did on France 68, was not only looking at the history of the role of the French Communist Party, a reformist organization, in demobilizing and saving the de Gaulle government in 1968, but you also looked at the fate of the radicals as well. The Financial Times uh, loved, loved this, printing an article saying that Danny Con bendit who became, subsequently became a Green Party MP, the former street fighter and all that, became a Green Party MP. Daniel Cohn-Bendit was now supporting Emmanuel Macron in France 50, uh, 50 years later. And Matt and myself would be very, very familiar with people like Martin McGuinness, a neighbor of mine, somebody I have a lot of, lot of time for, who went from being uh, a gunman uh, and a street rioter in order to in respectable po politics. That's why it's important, I think, for us to argue that and it's great to be in this room with people who have actually that live in content continuity, to argue for a strategy that relies on working class struggle as the key uh, to, 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 to social change, about, uh, about workers' role in production and so on, and that rejects those two, uh, th th those two alternative strategies, that uh, neither of which have faith in the working class, the reformist strategy that will always take that movement halfway and direct it into the uh, uh, conventional channels of politics, or the people who attempt to take shortcuts through street fighting, uh, guerrilla struggle, or, 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 or any, other, any other sort of method, and we need a revolutionary party to do that. So, Maria, if you'd like to start. This actually book has got the, the poster that we were made in uh, the occupied LSE. That was a poster, actually, that they were trying, actually, to put it all around the streets. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> that was a poster that we were made in uh, Occupy the LSE, the guy, what the guy Fox, uh, and we were putting them all around. We, we didn't have money, but it was also money because we were occupied, we were making our posters like the French comrades were making the posters in, uh, in Paris. So we made it and we were putting the posters all around in London. So few of us were arrested because the police could not really tolerate that people were coming outside with this poster. I think it was sometime around the September or October of 1967. Anyway, uh, coming back, a uh, few comments and some, uh, some things. Uh, the, the occupation uh, of, the British, of the Greek embassy didn't come just out of the blue. It came after an occupation of uh, LSE. So I'm saying that, that the occupation of the, the universities were the first way of reacting against uh, the government and against racism at that period. Racism particularly because they, they had uh, put as a principal of LSE, uh, Adams, who was uh, a principal down in Rhodesia. So the time that they said that uh, they, he's going to become a, a, the principal, we started occupying the, the place because we say that's what you, you, is your choice, that's the government. So we occupy and then this moved to the occupation of the, of the Greek embassy and actually it wasn't just only semi-anarchists, there were people also from uh, LSE uh, Socialist Society and from uh, IS that 
you weren't there, but it was Chris Harmon and the others. Chris Harmon was lucky because he was uh, in a police van that uh, they kicked the door and they just uh, left free. That's the way that they won in the trial. So that's part of the story. Uh, the second thing is that uh, this link between the occupation of LSE and the occupation of the Greek embassy shows actually how the, the fight was linked between different countries. It wasn't just because they were the same people, but because it was the inspiration. The moment that you had the example, even before 68, you understand that in after 68, the example it was and nothing was isolated in a period that there, every, every, the, the movement understood its power and uh, they couldn't stop anything. So from this point of view, you had all this generalization, not only in, uh, in, rea in resistance, but generalization in forming uh, revolutionary governments and uh, revolutionary parties. And I want to come to this last one, because that's the question. Why the level revolutionary parties of 68 didn't survive afterwards? And you had just uh, one part of the revolutionary parties of 68, the IS tendency that survived out of that. And I think that that's a very important question for, the re for three reasons. The first reason is that uh, how you, the assessment of a period, it's very important. The period is not going always up. It goes up, it went for 10 years, it was an uprising. And then you had the ruling class, you had the uh, reformist parties, you had all the, the powers trying to stop it. And you had a period actually of downturn, how you assess those periods. So it's very important actually what we are assessing today and we say it's a contradictory period. It's a contradictory period, yes. And that's how you, you relate to that. The second thing is how you relate and how you relate and what's your choices. And it's very important that we are saying in this period, the choice of building a big anti-racist, anti-fascist movement all around the world is very important. And the revolutionary left has to put itself in the center of this fight. It has to be, and at the same time, put itself in the center of this fight, and at the same time, recruit. That's how we actually we try to build in Greece, being the center of the resistance of the anti-racist, anti-fascist, and at the same time trying to recruit and build up a very strong revolutionary party. So we, we are in this period, 68 is now, from the point of view of experience, I'm not saying anything, and we've got all the experience, people experienced with 68 and all the fights to try really and uh, Build, revolu uh, build the resistance and build the revolutionary parties. Yeah, um, I'll just make a, a, a couple of points. Um, I mean, I think that, that, that try. Um, I think two, two of the themes that have been touched on, um, particularly in, in you know in regards to the socialist tradition in nineteen. Speak into it. Is that any better? Um, two of the themes that have been touched on, um, particularly in regards to the socialist tradition in, in, in 1968, is, is understanding why 68 emerged, but then also understanding actually, what, I suppose, why things uh, went wrong or what, what strategically, what could have, uh, uh, what, what different outcomes could have happened in, in the different places across the world. And I would echo the point made uh, certainly about reading Chris Harmon's book. It's the best book on uh, 68 and a few pages. He manages to say more about Ireland than what uh, many, many others had attempted to do. Um, but I, I say, I think the change in material conditions are fundamental because actually there is a kind of a media caricature of 68 that it's all about kind of students who, who got loose for a couple of months and then um, kind of retreated back into the accepting capitalism. But as Harmon well argues, the, the the explosions were much more profound and much deeper and were products of the contradictions within the system that not only exploded in 68 but continued in the aftermath of, of 1968 and that's very evident in Ireland. Someone mentioned France and the kind of uh, the change in needs of, 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 of French capitalism. 
That's also the case in Ireland. It's a very similar process. The Orange State was built upon one-party rule. It was built upon a large shipping industry. It was built upon uh, the large textile industry. This had gone into profound decline um, 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 in the years after partition, and it forced uh, the unionist state to open itself up to foreign capital. And this, these change in material conditions meant that there was an increase in students, an increase in Catholics in university, an increase in, in women in university, and this all kind of uh, added toward um, the kind of melting pot that exploded in 1968. But the other fundamental um, aspect is actually what is to be done and what could have been done. And I think that in here, when we have to we have to talk about the strength of revolutionary forces, and again, in Ireland, in some ways, it's 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 a lot more acute because the left was so small going into 1968. Again, I think I'm, I'm referencing Eamon McCann again. I think it was Eamon McCann who said that, you know, if we had had an organisation, even in Derry and Belfast, of 100 people at this time who understood the need to challenge the unionist state and the fight on the streets, but also could base it on class politics and, and Protestant and Catholic workers' unity. In some ways, that's, that's, that's the, the tragedy of 68 and 69 in the North and in Ireland, that, you know, the lack of, of socialist organisation. They kind of carry through on the politics and the ideas of what a small uh, a group of activists were doing. I think in, in, in Tony Cliff put it well, yep, where he said that they'd unleashed an avalanche that they found it difficult to control. Because actually what we see in 68 is the re-emergence of the Connollyite tradition in Ireland, the re-emergence of, 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 of the Marxist tradition in Ireland. I can't, don't have any time to go into that, but that's the real uh, uh, Marxist socialist tradition, um, the real anti-imperialist tradition. And actually, if you take that method and apply it to today, again, Ireland's changing greatly. If you look at the repeal vote, you can't understand the transformation that's happening in Ireland at the moment without understanding the change in material conditions, the entry of women into the workforce, the entry of women into, into, into the student population, etc., etc. You can't understand it without understanding the street movement that's developed, without understanding the entry of radical left socialists into the Irish Parliament to raise these issues. So that's, that's uh, in terms of that, the legacy of 68, we're building upon that today. Um, and as I say, as part, not, not on nationalist terms, but as part of, of a wider um, struggle for international socialism on this island, in Ireland and across the world. So I'll leave it there. Now we can't have a mention of Jefferson Airplane and not mention one or two other musical icons. Um, I'd like to talk about Bob Dylan and Chris Harmon, but that story will have to wait. I want to talk about Tariq Ali and Mick Jagger. Mick Jagger rang up Tariq Ali and read in the words of Street Fighting Man, and Tariq said, that's great, and it went out. Uh, those sorts of things happened in 1968. But there's a more serious point about the cultural musical revolution, which becomes much more obvious ten years later. The people that founded Rock Against Racism alongside the Anti-Nazi League which played a central role in smashing the National Front, were very much products of 1968. I haven't got time to even mention their names, but some people in this room will know about that and will know the importance of that cultural dimension in terms of the wider anti-racist movement. And we've got it again now, and I'm going to just actually end on this. We've got this creature called Morrissey, who is apparently supporting Tommy Robinson. Well, it seems to me that the, 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 new, the, the successor to Rock Against Racism, very much in that 68 tradition, of love, music, hate, racism, has in its capacity the, 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 the authority, the, the, the context to build up the sort of campaign culturally alongside the political campaign to defeat this kind of seepage into youth culture. That's incredibly important. Lots of all the other liberation movements, in many of the liberation movements, kind of fed into each other out of 1968 and continue to do so. The, I, I'm going to finish on that point. <laughs> 